Oh Clash Royale, you're getting old. Throughout the last eight years of this game's existence, it has undoubtedly experienced many updates that have shifted the paradigm of everything the game holds. Of course, with such updates and changes, the game has naturally evolved into one filled with many intricacies, quirks and cards for you to wield in battle. Yet, yeah, when wandering through the history of Clash Royale, an often overlooked golden age soon emerges within its launch year 2016. Gonali Evolutions, Level 15 and Elite Wild cards as today will be taking a trip into a much simpler era, where many players weren't even capable of conceiving the problems that play Clash Royale to this day. These were times of much simplicity, where Molt and Nick and Knight were opening up legendary chests hoping to max out their decks, where Chief Pat was infamously missing all of his rocket shots and where Clash Royale was all of the rage. Sucking away all of Clash of Clans' players like a vortex as the game managed to achieve millions of downloads within its first month of true existence. That's where my first discussion point begins the simplicity of what made Clash Royale so charming. Upon its iOS soft launch on January 2nd, 2016, Clash Royale had 14 cards of 3 rarities, common, rare and epic, for players to choose from. Many of these cards were inspired by Clash of Clans troops or concepts such as the Tesla Tower being a common card or the Giant, Valkyrie or Hog Rider representing the rare card category. Yeah, many of these cards that were housed within Clash Royale weren't carbon copies of those found in Clash of Clans. With the game forging its own identity within cards such as the knight, musketeer and the prince blending in to set a royal atmosphere for the game. You were no longer a strategist building a mighty empire, instead you were just dueling an opponent, with yourself representing the blue side of the arena whilst they represented the red side. These 14 cards of each rarity made building decks as well as unlocking cards rather easy, with people blending familiar Clash of Clans themed cards in their Clash Royale cards to create a deck that could destroy their opponents. On top of this, there were no more game modes other than the training arena and battle out in the multiplayer arena itself, of which it cost gold for a brief period of time before a balance update patched it out and made it free. This is without mentioning how unbelievably easy it was to grasp the game's mechanics back then. Although it never went into detail about a specific strategy, the default deck it assigned to you placed a giant at the forefront with a knight and archer sitting behind the giant as a second means of defence as you took down the trainer's towers. Naturally the gameplay experience was a lot different with yourself playing up against real people, but back then nobody knew what they were doing and with the cards being relatively unbalanced, it made for a positive learning experience as well as the opportunity for players to have a lot of fun. This coupled with the relatively easy to understand chess rewarding system, the free chest that could be claimed multiple times a day as well as a crown chest made for a healthy progression system. Of course, not all simplicity is a good thing and I'm capable of acknowledging that. Only having 14 cards of each rarity prior to the pre-global launch would have made the game incredibly stale. And I know all the cards were easy to understand as players managed to gain a grip on the game after their first few matches. Those matches would soon grow repetitive thanks to an onslaught of decks surrounding the Hog Rider, Giant, Balloon and Expo. This is also without mentioning how popular the practice was of using money to buy gems to open up chests in the hopes of unlocking different cards and maxing out your deck. Shortly before Clash Royale's global launch, the game introduced a few more cards. But most importantly, it introduced a new legendary rarity in which the Ice Wizard and Princess were slotted into. A fun fact about legendaries was the fact that they were all released at level 6 instead of level 9. Then again, all card rarities at this earlier point of the game were a little strange, especially the levels, with almost every single rarity starting off at level 1 during the really early stages of the game. Consequently, the addition of legendary cards led to a mad rush of content creators beginning to open up chests to unlock these legendaries, arguably hyping up Clash Royale immensely for its March 2nd global release date at the detriment of creating one of the first pay to win controversies within the same week of the game's release. It may have been fun to watch Molten OJ, Nick and Knight and many other creators of the Clash Royale's Golden Age open up different chests in the hope of maxing out their cards but in actuality, this was an experience mainly reserved for those that with a lot of money filling their wallets or content creators to entertain us whenever new updates launched. Yeah, this rampant spending ended up spreading these videos far and wide within YouTube's algorithm, raising awareness of what Clash Royale was and bringing in many people to witness a year filled with some of Clash Royale's best updates. Speaking of the updates, it's time for my second discussion point about how memorable entertaining and useful many of the updates were. A huge theme throughout discussing the updates and what they brought to the game will be the prominent amount of cards that were added to the game as well as the bug fixes and balance changes associated with them. Merely a month after the game had released globally, the Clash Royale developers were already hard at work, producing more cards to add in, in the form of the Ice Spirit, Bowler, Lumberjack and Log, of which the vast majority of these cards were advertised on Clash Royale's official YouTube channel to build hype for their inevitable release later in June. This
This June update also featured another exciting feature known as tournaments. Although they were quite expensive, it allowed friends or more realistically content creators to open up semi-competitive tournaments in which people would either win rewards from the newly introduced tournament chests as well as perhaps real life prizes. A system which preceded Clash Royale's crown competition which would come in 2017. Coupled with a new additional arena, Frozen Peak, this update would be the first of a few of this year that made 2016 such a wonderful year for Clash Royale. Although the popularity of the game in combination with the update roadmap was most likely unrelated, considering release roadmaps are usually crafted before the game officially launches, frequent updates on this level were a key ingredient in propelling Clash Royale into the stratosphere regarding its popularity. Although the game has started off quite simple, these new legendary cars mixed in with these additional cars being sprinkled into the game within its first month of its global launch began a domino effect, with many people at the time either telling their friends in school or at work about Clash Royale. The frequent updates that came with the game as well as the fact that the game was relatively easy to learn and just put in your pocket. It also helped that Clash Royale was released with an already functional clan system as well as a system for when you exceeded 3000 trophies, of which you gained legendary trophies after each season reset. Not only could you gather these friends within the clan and help them out with donations, you could also actively compete with them in one place, bragging about how you managed to reach 3000 trophies and even push far beyond that mark so fast. Well, speaking of 3000 trophies, that didn't remain the maximum amount of trophies for very long. There were so many people playing Clash Royale and discovering what it had to offer to the point where Supercell had to expand the seasonal reset ceiling by another 1,000 trophies, bringing it up to 4,000 to cope with how many people were in the top 500 who were sitting mere trophies away from one another. Naturally, with a new addition to the seasonal trophy reset ceiling came the opportunity to add more arenas, although unfortunately another arena wouldn't be added until 2017 in the form of the Jungle Arena. Throughout the summer, the game was relatively dormant with updates thanks to Supercell's annual vacation. At least that was until September of 2016, where we saw the addition of the Mega Minion and the Ice Golems, two rare cards which accompanied the addition of two legendary cards, which happened to be the Inferno Dragon and Graveyard. I remember how exceptionally annoying it was to deal with someone baiting your lob with some goblins or skeletons only for them to throw down an Ice Golem, Graveyard and Inferno Dragon. If your opponent was out of Elixir, it was really that easy to win the game back then. This was also the time when one of the first prominent meta decks formed, as the Graveyard spell upon its release had a reputation for being notoriously overpowered. In combination with the giant and inferno dragon, it had the potential to win games whilst people kept their eyes closed. Thankfully, this update was followed by a much requested ability to mute your opponent's emotes, considering toxicity was on the rise within the early competitive scene of the game and was bound to get worse with the addition of challenge mode. At one point, Supercell straight up refused to add such a feature to the game, citing that it interfered with the community aspect and spirit of Clash Royale. However, with the September update, it's unclear clear why they decided to go against their original stance, but I assume some developer ended up being rocket cycled and having their opponents spam the laughing king emote the entire time, and that may have influenced their decision. This ability to mute emotes was sorely needed, as in November, Clash Royale saw the addition of the Elite Barbarians, Tornado, Clone, and Electro Wizard cards. Three out of four of these cards were used in a toxic manner, especially the Elite Barbarians, which still somewhat haunt the modern day state of Clash Royale like a spectre, unwilling to die despite being released almost eight years ago at this point. This was also around the time that one of the first real skilled deck metas were beginning to form. I wouldn't call Hog 2.6 insanely skilled, but a primitive form of this deck did exist. Not only was the game evolving with these updates, but the players were too, considering many of them now had a formidable idea of what they were doing with the new cards being added to the game. All of these updates were entertaining, useful when added fresh additions to the game, but I like to believe that the best feature that was added to 2016 happened to be the clan chest. This was introduced in the December 2016 update and was easily the best way for clans filled with friends to come together and to use all of their knowledge of Clash Royale to crash down on their opponents in tournaments and 1v1s, collecting crowns to fill the chest up until it was at its limit. This update also came with a rather confusing collection of cards within the form of the Dark Goblin, Ram Rider, Goblin Gang, Executioner. Half of these cards were mainly themed around promoting the upcoming jungle arena but 3 out of 4 of these cards were countered by the Executioner, who was beyond broken at the time and needed a nerve desperately. In fact, the execution was so painful to play against that many people considered this update to be the end of Clash Royale's year of golden glory. Considering the cards beforehand had been tolerable, yet the execution was such a dynamic yet overpowered card to the point where you could slot them into any deck and he would dominate against anything you threw at him, leading to a massive amount of stalemates and repetition taking shape. Although this update arguably marked the end of Clash Royale's short-lived golden age, there's one important aspect that I've occasionally mentioned in passing but requires discussion considering that there's the most important aspect 
aspect of Clash Royale's popularity vastly exceeding expectations. And this happens to be my final discussion point, the content creators who entertained everyone. I'm sure this will be the throwback, but I personally remember watching some of Phone Cats' streams back during Clash Royale's golden age. It was a little less conventional compared to everything else on YouTube, but the unprocessed and raw feeling of watching someone play the game alongside the frustration that manifested really painted a picture and helped me personally get invested into the game, and I'm sure that's the case for some of you in the audience as well. Although the scene was still young for Clash Royale, as the game itself was only out for 9 months during this time, at least publicly, Nick and Knight and Malt were easily the most iconic duo of the time. If you were around during 2016, there was no way you were going to go without watching a Nick at Night or Malt video related to Clash Royale. These videos were unbelievably entertaining and the dynamic both Nick and Malt had was simply infectious. Helping to spread Clash Royale further alongside their iconic videos, opening up chests to max out their decks, namely opening them up for legendary cards. They weren't just famous for that either, with them notably completing all sorts of strange challenges during the drier parts of 2016 to provide people with entertainment and encouraging people to push the craziness to the limit within Clash Royale. If this is a Clash Royale video themed around 2016 being the golden age, I can't forget about Chief Pat and those iconic rockets. With the accuracy akin to a blind archer, I remember clearly watching some of those streams live as well as those videos of Chief Pat missing countless rockets, either on towers or on troops. To be fair though, rocket predictions were the hardest back then as all the other spells were rather instantly acting and the rocket took a business day to land on target. That didn't excuse the multitude of times he missed the princess towers though. Orange Juice Gaming, simply known as OJ nowadays, was your best friend in regards to learning how to play the game, gathering decks as well as tutorials. He threw in the occasional fun video here and there but he was mainly your source for what the meta was during this time as well as how to destroy your opponents. Naturally we had Galadon who was infamous for his tournaments themed around Clash Royale. With the budget to host essentially mini esports tournaments, he saw great success posting the results of these tournaments as well as generally hosting them for his subscribers to enjoy. I'm sure even a few of you may have joined these tournaments and found yourself at being absolutely hammered by people hunting for the max prize of those sweet tournament chests, of which Galadon always made sure to make them absolutely ridiculous and to ramp up that competitive spirit to the absolute maximum. Unfortunately, Clash Royale has some bad apples during this time, with some of the most notorious clickbaiters being Eclipse and Master Saint, always making remarks about different easter eggs, glitches and secret supercell were keeping away from the people, which usually resulted in some of the most overpowered decks in the game. Of course, these videos were fake and mainly just engagement bait to get people to watch until the 10 minute mark so these people could place an absurd amount of mid-rolls ads to make money. Thankfully, out of the many channels that died during this time, both Master Saint and Eclipse bit the dust, just deleting most of their content. There are some other notorious names to mention such as Clash with Ash or Clash for Cam, as well as many other people that I just can't remember off the top of my head, but the run-ins with Clash Royale that they had were relatively short and they lost passion for the game or simply uploaded less. Either way, every single content creator on this list with their own unique and sometimes controversial ways of creating content ended up spreading Clash Royale wider than ever seen before. Although nowadays we have names such as b Rand, Riley, Aragon, Crusher21, Full Tilt Gaming and Cashban amongst others to thank for the entertainment we witness nowadays, in 2016 the community was naturally a lot more closely knit and Malt's reputation as a slightly salty wine and it ended up ensuring the game was stabilised back in the day, with every single content creator no matter how big or small undoubtedly contributing to Clash Royale's unprecedented rise as well as the transition into the golden age that it experienced throughout 2016. Ever since 2016, I personally feel as if Clash Royale has never managed to reach the same heights as it did upon launch. This is usually typical for a game to have one massive amount of popularity upon launch before laying dormant but with how much the game has evolved, it's honestly surprising to see that 2016 still remains its golden age. I wonder why that is. The development team was also much smaller and much more invested compared to what we have today. One more important thing I'd like to add before ending this video is the fact that there's obviously some personal bias, nostalgia attacks, and favoritism here. I was young when Clash Royale released, around 10 to 11 years old, and this game was absolutely phenomenal to me all of those years ago. In some of your eyes, Clash Royale is peaking, or it's burning, or it's just stuck in limbo. But for me, 2016 would always be the golden age of Clash Royale, and you may agree with me too. Don't get me wrong, 2016 was also a really good year for Clash Royale, at least up until the disaster that was touched down, but I feel like it pales in comparison to everything that was on offer during 2016. The level of hype, the relevancy, the quality of the content as well as everyone's joint enjoyment of the game was personally on another level in comparison to what would come during the later years of Clash Royale's lifespan. What do you think? Do you think 2016 was Clash Royale's golden age or was there a different time period of the game that you enjoyed instead? I would personally love to hear your experience with the game, especially especially considering
thing nowadays we have the evolved Mega Knight and Pekka. Nostalgia is honestly the only thing saving us at this point.